Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel. Honestly, you don't want to be taking generic legal advice from a YouTube channel or podcast in any event. On with the show. Hello and welcome to another Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing partner of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And today, let's just get right into it. Google announced at the Game Developers Conference a brand new, I don't know if you'd call it a platform, but certainly a style of how they intend to bring video games to the modern audience, which they are calling Stadia, which, as I pointed out on my own social media, is the plural form of stadium because stadium is just too normal a word for the big tech giants to use for one of their products. Uh, But Stadia is designed to be Google's entry point into video gaming. They actually had titled their GDC 2019 press conference as essentially the vision of the future of gaming. Uh, And so I want to talk to you a little bit about what they announced, what we saw them present today, and why or why not that might be a version of the future or the literal future of gaming if this really excited you. Uh, And I have my own thoughts on that and whether or not it really is a giant step forward. I certainly think there's a lot of interesting things to discuss here uh, and certainly interesting in the overall kind of uh, geography of the big tech giants and the console manufacturers, Nintendo, Microsoft, and Sony that we, we know and love. Um, So let's take a look at what they've got here. We're at the Stadia.com website, which is what they put up at the end of their uh, presentation. It says, Stadia, the future of gaming is not a box. Introducing Stadia, a new gaming platform from Google for playing AAA video games across all kinds of screens. Then it says sign up for updates because the thing's not out. And then they have these five bullet points. These are the takeaways they want you to know as they go forward. And we're also going to take a look at Uh, a TechCrunch article, which got out and started talking about exactly what they said at the presentation as well. It says, game where you want, when you want, play across multiple devices, including laptops, desktops, and select phone and tablets. High-speed internet connection is required because Google is playing the games for you. New ways to play through YouTube and beyond. Go from watching a video to playing a game in seconds with even more innovative experiences to come for select games. There you see YouTube, which is obviously owned by Google and is something that they're putting forward and trying to get some additional business for through the Stadia enterprise. Up to 4K HDR at 60 frames per second. Enjoy gaming the way you love with beautiful HDR graphics and smooth frame rates. 4K HDR at 60 frames per second are dependent on your bandwidth. Gameplay experience may vary based on quality of internet connection. As we're used to when we start talking about cloud services and video game services that go through those kinds of connections, you have all the warnings here that you would expect. Hey, whatever magic we can deliver through your pipes, uh, your pipes have to be big enough to get all that magic or else it's not going to work, which I think is going to be part of the discussion that we wind up having about the adoption of this, about whether or not the infrastructure is ready for something like this and, and how you feel if Comcast or Time Warner or whomever winds up losing your internet connection for the evening if your library of video games and movies and music uh, all live in the cloud. So there are interesting things to discuss there. The last two points they make, play instantly, no updates, no downloads, jump right into the game. This is them selling the Netflix experience. You actually saw them reference the fact that music and movies had moved to a kind of streaming mentality. People want to click on a box and be playing that thing. uh, And that's what they are trying to achieve with Google Stadia, which is gonna take a little while to get used to as a name. And then they also say, always getting better. Stadia's cloud-based infrastructure evolves to meet the demands of players, developers, and YouTube creators. So they want you to know you can cross screens, you can play instantly, you can interact with YouTube, you can get the graphics that you are expecting from a piece of software that you're operating on a box underneath your TV, and that they will keep working to improve it. Those are the five points they've got on their main website. Those are the things that marketing wants you to take away from the Stadia announcement. Let's take a look at a few of the more specific items uh, in the TechCrunch article. So we've got here an article that says, 
Google Stadia's game streaming platform kills downloads and lets you play anywhere. On stage at GDC, Google CEO Sundar Pichai announced the company's latest big initiative, taking on the entire gaming industry with a live streaming service called Stadia that will be launching this year. The service will let gamers leave their hefty GPUs and expensive systems behind. Pichai says that the service can be used on devices with a Chrome browser and an internet connection. To Google, that means Stadia will launch on desktops, laptops, TVs, tablets, and phones. The service will work across platforms so you won't just be competing with other Stadia users. Google working on new gaming efforts here isn't exactly a surprise. Last fall, the company launched a pilot program of sorts with Project Steam, uh, Project Stream. Don't let me confuse you with the Valve product Steam. Uh, That's an entirely different video gaming platform. Allowing gamers to stream gameplay of Assassin's Creed Odyssey in their internet browser at 1080p and 60 frames per second. At launch, Stadia will support 4K uh, and HDR, which we saw on their stat sheet. The stat we're waiting to hear about is latency and what sort of ranges the service has been hitting ahead of launch. And I think that's going to be one of the items we definitely discuss on this video, is the nature of the technology, exactly how much magic sauce they have in there, because the constant kind of drumbeat of issues with the streaming services, if you have played uh, PlayStation Now or Gaikai or anything of the earlier kind of iterations of this streaming process, the basic notion being... Uh, you put your giant Xbox or your giant PlayStation at a server center somewhere. It plays the game and sends you a video of what it's playing that you can react to. Obviously, that has a couple more trips through the old internet that require you to get your input to the video game service. So that latency has to be low if you're going to interact, especially with an action game. Uh, playing PlayStation Now, which I've used on a number of occasions, it works best with turn-based games, as you would expect, things that don't require that kind of minute-to-minute Twitch interactivity. Uh, But with action games, there is a a level of latency with PlayStation now that, admittedly, I think you kind of get used to. It kind of just feels a little bit heavier, uh, a little bit more like you're playing a 30 frame per second or a 20 frame per second game where you just have to anticipate what you want to do a little bit more. And it is something that you can live with, but it isn't a native feeling experience in the PlayStation service. So it is interesting to kind of think about exactly what Google's got cooking here and whether or not it is the kind of service that will get us to a place where that latency is essentially forgotten uh, and we're playing a game just as if it were operating on a box uh, underneath our TV. Obviously, the difference between video games and movies or other passive entertainment is a a company like Netflix can buffer uh, as much time as it really needs uh, by making you wait on that little bar or the little spinning circle until it has enough kind of preloaded to survive whatever your bandwidth issues might be because nothing changes uh, in what you're viewing passively on a, on a Netflix experience. Video games being completely different insofar as you can move the camera around, you can stop, you can do anything else. It's, it's an entirely interactive experience that presents different technological problems and problems that uh, the industry as of yet has not completely solved, although Google is certainly crowing about having solved it in this presentation they made today. Uh, The company also showed off a dedicated Stadia controller, though you'll also be able to use your existing third-party controllers or keyboard and mouse. Uh, Speaking of hardware, Google has partnered with AMD to create a custom high-end GPU for Stadia that the company says pushes more than 10.7 teraflops, uh, which they also pointed out is a a number of additional teraflops over Xbox One X and PlayStation 4 Pro. Obviously, we're now in a situation where even if Google is pushing 10.7 teraflops, you've got that kind of the the slowest man in the race is going to get some of that developer attention and the games are going to have to be able to be run on those as long as they have a critical mass of kind of audience. Uh, So uh, if the next PlayStation, the PlayStation 5, or if the Xbox Infinite or whatever they wind up calling their next generation console does have fewer than that in terms of teraflops or is otherwise kind of slower, you can expect developers to not exactly use all that extra space. Uh, And certainly the question is exactly how those systems are built at Google's level in any event and whether or not those are servicing more than one uh, customer at a time or anything else that we really don't know about how their cloud infrastructure operates. Uh, The article finishes up by saying when it comes to gaming, Google is an underdog here. Though the company obviously has a massive mobile gaming platform with Android, when it comes to desktop gaming, the tech giant doesn't have a ton of background, aside from the sporadic efforts on PC virtual reality. One would imagine that Microsoft or Valve are the best positioned here, but Google has some pretty heavy mindshare with YouTube gaming and some pretty heavy infrastructure with Google's data centers. Uh, Google certainly has ample reason to want gamers to move away from Windows PC to systems with more lightweight onboard compute. The idea of running something heavier than Minesweeper equivalents on a Chromebook can be pretty interesting, 
the idea of doing that across all your devices could be game changing. Uh, and that's really what we saw today was a relatively short presentation, a little bit light on specifics, certainly technological specifics. And from my perspective as a business lawyer, as a business guy, uh, they showed almost nothing of the business model, which we're going to talk about in just a second. Uh, but that's basically what they said. Hey, you can stream this stuff. It's a PlayStation Now like equivalent, uh, but you can transfer that stream from your Chromebook to your phone, to your tablet, back to your TV, back to a desktop. Uh, as we see in the picture here, uh, but they really didn't say how these things are going to be sold, how they're going to be purchased, how that interaction is going to happen. Uh, and one thing that isn't really mentioned here in this article is they did have a section of their presentation that really kind of tried to emphasize that YouTube gaming component, that you could interact with streamers in very specific ways, that you could play the moment in a game that the streamer just played on your own game through some kind of save transfers or something along those lines. That one wasn't really clear and it was a little pie in the sky. That kind of conceptual stuff we used to see a little bit more often at uh, the E3s of the world. Uh, but that seemed to be something that they were trying to push towards because, uh, frankly, they're not idiots and they can see that the kind of influencer streaming community is a big one and certainly is and will be uh, a driver of video game sales just as much as any other kind of pop culture sales in the near future. So in that respect, they have that vision of the future uh, absolutely correct. Um, other than that, I do have issues with this presentation. So I do want to talk about uh, some of the things that kind of jumped out at me as being potentially problematic uh, in what they presented, uh, the first of which you already heard me talk about. They completely lacked a business model to, to reference in this presentation. They didn't tell us how the games were going to be sold. They didn't tell us whether they were going to uh, uh, have licenses that you were going to essentially purchase and have access to that game for all time, whether they were going to work on a Netflix or Game Pass type subscription model. Uh, where they were essentially going to have you uh, sign up for a Google service on a monthly basis and pay them money and have access to a library that you would lose access to when that subscription lapsed. I strongly suspect that's going to be the primary business model for this service. It seems silly to not be thinking in that direction when you have seen that uptake from Game Pass at the Microsoft level and they are working almost exclusively with third-party developers. I think there is an appetite in general, in the U.S. at least, uh, for these kinds of uh, buffet services where you pay one price and you get access to the whole panoply of whatever it is they have to offer. That certainly is exemplified by Hulu and Netflix and, and otherwise. Uh, you see here this video issue. This was actually in the presentation. This was not uh, my video. Um, there it is. Uh, but... I think without that business model, you're asking people to get excited about something that they don't know what is going to cost. They don't know what it looks like. Uh, they talked about that you don't need any hardware, but that's a little bit disingenuous, not entirely. You certainly need uh, the, the phone or the laptop or the computer that interacts uh, with Google uh, and Android in a specific way. Uh, and you're going to need, if you're uh, on those phones and tablets, they don't talk about any kind of Apple interactivity. We're going to talk about that in a second, but it certainly seems that Stadia is essentially putting a foot, another foot in the open door of really being used as an attack vector against kind of Amazon and Apple. And so you are looking at something that maybe isn't accessible without a change in hardware of some kind. And they talk about being able to use uh, the, the service on a TV requiring a, a, a Chromecast, uh, which is a Fairly de minimis expense. I think it's 50 or $60, but it's not nothing. Uh, and so you would be having to at least equip your house in some respect to have this work. And at the end of the day, you wouldn't have a console that can just play games without the internet, which I think is interesting. Moving on, I think the question of ownership issues is one that continues to be important in the industry. We saw when Microsoft first started to try to launch its Xbox One and started talking about essentially having licenses uh, to these video games that maybe weren't exactly representative of what we think of as ownership today. Uh, and that was, wound up being a roadblock. That wound up being a problem for people that wanted to adopt the Microsoft platform. Here you have Google essentially saying, uh, whatever their business model is, whatever access you're going to get to their product, uh, you're not going to really own the thing. Uh, if the internet is down, if Comcast isn't getting you your internet or otherwise, uh, you're not going to be able to play these games. And, and so I think that is going to be a stumbling block certainly for kind of the more old guard gamer uh, that was used to things a certain way, that was used to going down to the uh, GameStop or Electronics Boutique and buying that disc for the PlayStation or that cartridge for the Nintendo 64, they may or may not be ready to kind of move to an all-streaming environment where essentially 
all of your uh, rights, all of your ownership uh, lives uh, at the largesse or at the technological ability of Google to get that information to you. Uh, and so I think that is going to continue to be a discussion point within the industry. And I think it's going to be, as they say, a point of friction for adoption of their service. And it's going to be something that we're going to want to look at because I think if I'm Google, I'm spending a few of my marketing dollars trying to smooth out that friction, trying to explain why owning a disc, owning the product uh, isn't that important to you because I do think that is potentially a, a stumbling block to kind of adoption of, of the service. Um, Next, I do think the technology is a question. Uh, we talked about it a little bit earlier in this video, uh, but they promised that the latency is going to be just fine. They talked about Project Stream, uh, which is something that they did last year where essentially they streamed 1080p, 60 frames a second, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Hoglaw's number one game of the year from 2018, to various uh, essentially Chrome browsers, laptops and computers, uh, and they got very good reports from that. They got reports from their customer bases that were in that beta, uh, that it functioned very well, that it didn't have problematic latency. But I have a couple questions there. Uh, you know, there is a question about whether or not the people that were interacting with that game are regular gamers and are used to uh, good or bad latency in the games that they're playing. I certainly think Anybody that's just kind of exposed to PlayStation now uh, is impressed by it because it does work. Uh, it just feels a little bit heavier. Uh, and while maybe you don't mind that, and I don't necessarily mind it, the more action-oriented, the more kind of pixel-perfect people that are playing these video games, I think can sense these things are more sensitive to them. So that latency is going to be a continuing question, and whether or not the reports they got from Project Stream are essentially as sensitive as you would like to really be embraced by the entire gaming community is an open question to me. Uh, we see here on the back of the controller they have the Konami code, which I found funny while I was watching the presentation. Uh, the other part of that technology question is whether or not it can expand. Obviously, Google is one of the biggest tech companies in the world, and so we would expect if anybody can expand that kind of ability, it's them. But there is always a technological question of you've got a beta, you've got Project Stream, it goes out to 1,000 or 10,000 or whatever, and then you want to expand that process, you want to use your servers, you want to use the power of the cloud to serve games to a million or 5 million or 10 million, uh, and you've got to wonder whether or not the technology, even if it can work on kind of a small basis, can be expanded to those kinds of numbers. And I think that's an open question that obviously since... The, the people in general haven't gotten to test uh, the, the latency question even on a small scale is going to continue to plague them uh, as they move forward and try to market this. Obviously, they say they have some demos on the floor at GDC. I think there are going to be journalists and video game people that are going to get to check it out. Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me if we get very positive reports from those experiments because Google would be silly to present demos that don't feel good in that environment. But we are talking about a very similar kind of small beta test uh, in San Francisco and not something that we can necessarily extrapolate the performance out for for the entire group of people that would want to try this, which isn't to say they can't do it. Honestly, uh, if you would have told me that Netflix can do what it does with the resolutions that it can do 15 years ago, it would have sounded like black magic. So I think technology is moving forward in this direction. The question is whether or not this is the actual time when this, something like this is going to work or whether this is just the next kind of bite at the apple that is going to lead us down that path, but we're still five or 10 years out. Um, the next item that I had when I was watching this uh, announcement was the notion of kind of resistance, of natural resistance in the gaming community to an announcement like this. And I think part of, part of that story is the fact that Microsoft really kind of scorched the earth on this a little bit. If you do remember those E3 presentations on Xbox One and the power of the cloud and Crackdown 3 and all these things that the cloud could do and that Microsoft was going to do for you and how many of them essentially evaporated, uh, that we only got a Crackdown this year that really doesn't perform up to those promises from years ago, uh, that Google is making a very similar type of claim, a very similar type of uh, discussion point here that says, believe in the cloud, the cloud will deliver all, it'll get you better multiplayer, it will get you better graphics, it will allow you to stream to all these different content devices. Obviously, Google is the kind of company that could do that kind of thing, but I think there is a natural resistance towards, hey, it wasn't that long ago that we were being told these kinds of same snake oil promises in the video game community. And so you're really going to have to show me something, Google. I think they're going to have to really get out there and have live performances and, and live performance reviews that get out there and have people say, yes, this thing works. It works tremendously well. It does everything they promised. And you guys should get on board before you're really going to have that adoption. I think there is going to be that natural resistance. 
the next thing I wanted to talk about was with respect to Google's strategy here. Without a business model, it's very difficult to see exactly how they're positioned to make money on this endeavor. And as a reminder, if you follow virtual legality or you follow this channel, corporations are designed to make return on investment for their stockholders. And so there has to be some kind of value proposition here. Now, the trick is it doesn't necessarily have to be a value proposition directly to Stadia. Stadia could be used as essentially a prop to prop up YouTube and to attack Twitch and Amazon or to attack Apple and their infrastructure that they have with the iPhone and iPad. It could be used for those purposes without directly making a ton of money. And we don't really know that. I think there is some truth to that kind of overall strategic vision. You didn't hear the word Twitch mentioned here. You didn't hear the word iPhone or iPad mentioned here. They are the owners of Android. They are going to be advocating for Android adoption. And so I think Stadia is another bullet point for them to advocate for the Android platform and against Amazon and Twitch and against Apple and iPhone and iPad. And I think that does make some sense. But the question is, what is the appetite for loss here? What if there isn't early adoption? We had the CEO of Google come out at the beginning of this presentation and basically say, I'm not that into gaming. Google is not a gaming company or they haven't been before Stadia. And so there is a continuing question of if this doesn't go so well, if it doesn't have early adoption, if God forbid something goes wrong with it, that it accidentally encourages spyware and steals somebody's data and there's a whole scandal, if something bad happens in respect of Stadia, what is Google going to do? And I fear that uh, with a company that is kind of branching out into a new area of expertise like gaming, you always run that risk of if something goes wrong, we're just going to sweep it under the rug. We're going to pretend it didn't happen. We're not really a gaming company. We're an, an IT and infrastructure and information services technology company. And we're going to move forward with that. That really reminds me of the kind of Google Glass concept where they had this really interesting idea. They got in trouble for essentially privacy and data concerns. It didn't have the adoption that they thought it would have. And it was quietly swept under the rug. So the question is whether Google Stadia is Google Glass or whether it's something that's going to become more popular and more uh, adopted by the rest of the gaming community. And will the fact that Google isn't really a gaming uh, company and hasn't done this before essentially cause another pause that goes along with that resistance that Microsoft might have scorched the earth for, that goes along with that resistance that latency and the, and the magic sauce isn't there, that goes along with resistance to the fact that you don't own the thing and that you're only streaming it and if your internet goes down, you don't have it. Uh, you know, is it going to all add up to essentially a very slow burn for the start of Stadia? And if it does, what kind of appetite does Google have to survive that kind of burn? Uh, and I think that's a that's a fascinating question. And I think it is one that's going to continue to drive the discussions of this. They've said at the, in this presentation that it's going to launch in 2019. Uh, so I think that's very interesting. And certainly whether or not uh, it does so, what that looks like when it launches, whether that's a subscription service, whether that's a handful of games, uh, what it means to launch, uh, we're not really familiar with because we haven't seen a platform like this. So we don't know what a launch looks like. So that is going to be interesting to follow as well, uh, as well as whether they're going to appear at E3 or any other kind of video game conventions to talk further about what this thing looks like. Obviously, they're comfortable at GDC. They're comfortable in San Francisco, uh, and they wanted to present it in this kind of casual format. Uh, but when they have to get people really excited about it, will they be able to do so? And especially, will they be able to do so if they're only selling essentially other people's games? We see here id coming up. They're going to talk about Doom Eternal. We saw a couple of other places where uh, Ubisoft and some other big hitter developers talk about that they're going to support the service. And I think that's great. But what we didn't really see is a first party offering. We saw Jade Raymond come up and she is now going to be heading essentially their first party game development group. And I think that's a, a great hire uh, and should lead to some fun stuff and some interesting things that are going to be on the Google platform. But for right now, they don't appear to have that. They don't appear to have anything to really show consumers that say, hey, you could only get this on Google or it's better on Google or otherwise. And so is the prospect of streaming games or following in the shoes of MatPat and other influencers to do whatever they're doing on YouTube really enticing enough for folks to leave their ecosystems behind, to leave their Xbox friends list, to leave their PlayStation achievements or trophies, uh, and to move on to this Google setup. We really haven't heard anything specific about what Stadia actually looks like other than that it's the streaming platform. So I do question whether or not 
essentially saving a couple hours on an initial download uh, is enough to get people to move into an entirely new way to own or to license or to use video games uh, when we don't know enough about what it's going to cost or what it's going to look like. And so that's really where I left off with the uh, the GDC 2019 presentation. Uh, while I love technology and I think it's very exciting for people to be exploring new ways to video game, new ways to interact, uh, and I think Google, with the amount of money they have, with the market capitalization they have, if they do have the internal corporate strategic appetite to throw their hat in the ring of video games, uh, can absolutely be successful. You can solve a lot of money. Uh, you can solve a lot of problems with a lot of money, uh, and Google has that money. But we've seen corporations try to step their foot uh, in the ring for video games. We've seen corporations outside of video gaming essentially try to do something that is outside their breadbasket, outside their spe specialization, and essentially get bopped on the nose when they start out and decide not to do it. That I do think there are some reasons to step back, wait a little bit longer for whether or not this product is going to make sense, whether or not it's going to make sense for you, whether or not it's going to make sense for me, and to really see exactly what this thing looks like. And that is if the technology actually works. Uh, so we're going to have to wait on that as well. But as of today, March 19th, 2019, it certainly is an interesting conversation to have. It's an interesting announcement. Uh, please do leave me comments on your thoughts about the Stadia announcement, whether or not you think it's going to be a, a big deal, whether it is a vision of the future of gaming, and how, if at all, Sony and Microsoft and Nintendo are likely to react to Google entering the fray. Uh, and if you like this video, please do like, please subscribe to this channel. This is Virtual Legality. We talk about business and law of information services, information technology, anything else that really catches my eye. I'm a corporate lawyer, so I tend to look at things from a contractual perspective. Uh, and uh, I do this uh, on a fairly regular basis. So uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, thank you very much for watching. And if you caught this on uh, a podcast version, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the next Virtual Legality. <laughs>